If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 8, 28. If you can have a favorite verse in the Bible, this for me is certainly one of them, one of the top ones that I've, I look to. Uh, this is a verse that has sustained Christians in the most difficult times throughout the centuries. Romans 8, 28. It says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Today, I just want to concentrate on one part of this verse. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. And uh, Lord willing, next week we'll, we'll keep, keep going in this, but I just want to really look at that phrase right there. So let's take this sentence and divide it into three parts. And we'll make each part a point to look at individually. So number one, God causes. Number two, all things to work together for good. Number three, to those who love God. Just divide it right up according to right right according to the words of the verse. So let's look at each of these points, but I'm going to start with the last point first. Uh, to those who love God. Romans 8:28 is a tremendous promise. It's an amazing promise. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. But this tremendous promise, it's limited. It's limited to a certain group of people only. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. The promise is for those who love God. If you're a person who loves God, whatever happens in your life, God is gonna make it all work together for your good. But if you don't love God, this promise isn't for you. It doesn't apply to you. The promise is limited. The world is divided really into two groups of people. There's many cultures, many age groups, many nations, uh, many languages, people with different colored skin, tall people, short people, male and female, but ultimately every person, no matter what age, what culture, what language, what sex, what ethnicity, what physical characteristics, every person on this planet is in one of two camps from God's perspective, those who love God and those who don't. You can put the whole world into one of those two camps. There's no third camp. You either love God or you don't. It's just as simple as that. Jesus talks about these two camps in several parables in the Gospels. Let, let me mention a couple of them to show you what I'm talking about. In Matthew 13, 47, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. The good fish and the bad fish, two camps, those who love God, those who don't. Listen to this slightly longer teaching of the same principle. Matthew 25, 32 says, all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and bite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will say also to those on his left. Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then, they'll, then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger, or naked or sick or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Two camps, the sheep and the goats, those who love God and those who don't. 
Romans 8, 28 is a tremendous promise to a limited audience. It's not a promise for everybody, but a promise to those who love God. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Now, this naturally raises a question, how do I know for sure if I love God or not? And that's a good question. It really is. And Jesus gives us the answer. In John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The one who loves the Lord will keep his commandments. John 14, 21 says, those who obey my commandments are the ones who love me. First John 5, 3 says the same thing. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So how can you know if you love God or not? Well, here's how. Do you keep God's commandments? Do you strive from your heart to obey the Lord? Does it matter to you or not if you break God's commandments? Is it a big deal to you if you sin? The person who loves God is a person who is very concerned to obey his commandments. The person who says, I love God, but practices a life of sin, the Bible would say they're deceived. Now, I'm not talking about perfection here. We all sin. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Indeed, there's not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. We all sin. But what the Bible's talking about is, do you aim, and, and, and this is talking to Christians, do you aim to obey God because you desire to please him? Do you turn away from sin because it, it matters to you that you obey your Father in heaven? Do you strive to obey God's commands? If so, you could rightly say, I love God. But if you are an unrepentant sinner, if you're living in a way that is odds with God's commandments and you are okay with that, it's your lifestyle, it's who you are, then you can't honestly say that you love the Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so the litmus test to prove if you love God or not is not a feeling inside, though we do have strong feelings and affections in our heart for, for the Lord. The litmus test to prove if you love God or not is to obey his commandments. And if you do, if obeying God's commandments are important to you, if you strive to obey God, if it matters to you, then know this. The Bible says you love God. And the promise of Romans 8, 28 is for you. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. If you do not love God, there is no promise. There's no assurance that anything will work out good for you. But if you love God, all things will work together for your good. Now, Let's go to the next point. Number two, all things, all things work together for good. Do, do you realize that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him? Now, it might seem like some things work together for our good, no doubt about it, but all things, all things, that is quite a statement. It's, it's very inclusive. It's easy to see how if you get a good job, that might work out for your good. It's easy to see if you have good health, that might work out for your good. Or if you are highly talented in some particular area in your life, that might work out for your good. It's easy to see how having a wonderful husband can work out for your good or a wonderful wife. It's easy to see how having a lot of money at your disposal can work out for your good. It's easy to see how having good friends can work out for your good. But do all things really work together for our good if we love God? For instance, what if, what if I have a sickness? What if I can't get out of bed? What if I can't work because I'm too weak? Does all this work together for my good? Well, the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. What if I just lost my job? What if I can't pay my bills? What if my house is on the line? Does even this all work together for my good? The Bible says, yes. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, the Bible doesn't say all things are good. It doesn't say all things are good. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that sickness is good. It doesn't say that being laid up is good. It doesn't say losing a job is good or losing a home. It doesn't say that losing a loved one is good. But it does say that God will work in all of these situations, no matter how bad they are. And he will cause them to work together for our good. And he'll bring good out of what is bad to those who love him. Let, let me give you some examples, some things to consider. What about sickness? We've all been sick at times, but not everyone knows what it's like to really be afflicted with an illness that is long lasting and debilitating. What about when someone is really afflicted? What about when someone is really in pain and they're suffering a great deal and there seems to be no end in sight? What good can come out of this? 
Only God knows for sure what he is accomplishing in that person. But certainly when a person is sick, God is accomplishing something. If they love him, people who go through a lot of affliction, they very often turn to God more. They look to him for comfort. They rely on him for strength. They get to know him and trust him. The person who is sick learns a deep sense of gratitude for the blessings that they do have. They put the world into perspective. They see what really matters, and that is their relationship to God. The, the person who is suffering looks forward to heaven. They keep their mind fixed on things above. Colossians 3.1 tells us, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. The sick person can usually do that easier than the person who is doing well. Have you ever considered that? Sickness is not pleasant. And yet the promise is this. If you love God, God will make your sickness and all that it entails to work together for your good, often in ways that you might not even realize. I wonder how many people have been saved from going to hell because God stopped them in their path to destruction by bringing them sickness so that they would turn to him. Many people repent and turn to God for salvation in the midst of sickness. What about financial loss and hardship? Many people are out of work. People lose their homes. That's a really sad thing. Can anything good come out of this? Well, the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. All things are not good, but all things work together for good to them that love God. God will take the person who has lost his job and show them how he will supply all their needs. Matthew 6, says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God knows what you need, and he will, he will supply it. In times of hardship, God, God often deepens a person's faith. He builds up a person's trust. He shows the Christian that he will indeed take care of them. Now, we have to be careful. We really have to be careful to read this verse for exactly what it says. It says all things. Christian, do you believe this? All things. Do you really believe that all things work together for good to those who love God? What about a divorce? Surely that is not a good thing. What good can come out of it? The ruin of a family? The separation of two people who once loved each other? Broken hearts? Divorce is tragic. Malachi 2.6 says, For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. God hates divorce. It certainly is not a good thing. Does the, pro does the promise even cover divorce? Well, the Bible says that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. God will take the person who loves him. He'll take the person who is brokenhearted because they've been abandoned or betrayed, and he'll make even that all work together for good. He'll mend the broken heart. Luke 4, 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. What about death? The death of a dear loved one, the heartbreak go so deep, the loss of a son or a daughter, a husband or a wife, a mother or a father. Death is surely tra tragic. The, the Bible calls death an enemy. In 1 Corinthians 15, 26, it says the last enemy that will be abolished is death. And so the Bible calls death an enemy. It's certainly not a good thing. And yet, even in this heartbreaking situation, the Bible still promises, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. God will take the person who loves him, whose heart has been broken by the loss of a loved one through death, and he'll make even that all work together for good. Christians who go through difficult times often have their faith deepened, their trust in God is often strengthened, their love for others and their love for God is increased. I know people personally who have suffered deeply and have told me in their deepest suffering is when they were the closest to God. Going through life's trials and tribulations is a hard thing, but to those who love God, good must come out of it because God has said it would. God takes all situations in our life, all of them, good and bad, blessings and tragedies, both. He takes them all and makes them all work together for our good. And the good is this, he uses every situation in our life to conform us and mold us and shape us and make us into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing. Romans 8, 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed 
to the image of his son. So Lord willing, we'll talk about that in great de greater detail in the next few Sundays. But Christian, know this, whatever comes into your life, if you love God, all things will work together for good. And the good is this, you'll be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, let me take this just a bit further. What about sin? What about sin? The Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Does this even include sin? We know that God hates sin. We know that evil will not dwell with him. Psalm 5, 4 says, oh God, you take no pleasure in wickedness. You cannot tolerate the slightest sin. God is not the author of sin. He takes no pleasure in it. He hates it. And so again, does the promise of Romans 8, 28 include sin when it says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that, to them that love God? Well, please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. If anyone is half asleep right now, either go all the way to sleep or wake up completely. Please don't misunderstand what I'm going to say right now because I'm not condoning sin. And so I want to say something very carefully that this promise really does say all things. And I would say that it even includes when a Christian falls into sin. Well, let me explain this. A Christian, one who loves God, is going to do their best to avoid sin. They love God, but even Christians fall. Christians fail. Christians backslide. Christians sin. We all know it. We all sin. Christians, when we sin, we grieve over it, we hate it, but we still fail, we still fall down. Paul says, I do what I don't want to do. I don't do what I do want to do. Who will deliver me from this body of death? There's a difference between a person who deliberately practices sin and a person who hates to sin. There's a difference between a person who lives in sin and one who falls into sin. The person who... The, the Christian doesn't live in sin. He, he's not practicing sin. And if he's caught up in some sin, he's miserable. So I don't want you to think that I am in any way condoning sin. The promises of Romans 8.20 is not for the person who's deliberately practicing sin without repentance because that person doesn't love God. But for the one who loves God, the one who really wants to please him, when that person falls into sin, I would argue based on Scripture, that God will even take that and cause it to work together for his good. Doesn't mean God is pleased with sin. Doesn't mean we should purposely sin. I'm just saying that a true Christian who loves God when he sins and he's miserable in his sin, God will even make that work out for his good. For instance, when a Christian sins, he's saddened because his fellowship with God has been hurt and he'll be more careful next time. When a Christian sins, he's reminded that he needs Christ in order to stay away from sin. He's humbled. He's reminded that he's not strong and that he can do nothing without Christ and he'll turn to Christ. When a Christian falls into sin, he's broken and he's contrite and reminded of the love and the grace that God has for him. God will at times pull back the restraints and let us go our way into sin so that we can be humbled and run back to him and realize afresh how weak we really are how much mercy we really need, and how much God loves us. Think of how Peter sinned so greatly. Matthew 26, 69, now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, you too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you were talking about. This is after Peter had walked with Jesus for three years. He says, I, I don't know what you're talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, this man was with Jesus of, his, of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. A little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, surely you too are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, before a, roast, a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. God took even this sin, and it was a grievous sin, but he made good come out of it. After Jesus rose from the dead, he said to Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes. And Jesus said again, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, I love you, Lord. And Jesus said again, Peter, do you love me? 
And Jesus said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he was deeply grieved in his heart. And Jesus said, go and feed my sheep. And that's what Peter did. He wrote two epistles, and he never denied Jesus again. Instead, he boldly proclaimed Christ with a passion. He was beaten for it. He was imprisoned for it. And in the end, church tradition says he was crucified for it. I think it would be reasonable to say that Peter's sin of denying Jesus left its mark on him so strongly. Peter was so broken by it, so ashamed that he would never, ever deny Jesus again. He would die first, and he did. God really and truly causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Let me quickly go to the last point, which is God causes. God causes. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. How, how is it possible that a sickness can work out to our good? How is it possible that a lost job can work out for our good? How is it possible that even such tragedies as divorce or death can work together for our good? How is it possible that even when a Christian falls into a grievous sin, how is it possible that any good can come out of that? How is it possible that for those who love God, even the worst of circumstances can and indeed must work out for our good. They work together for our good because it is God who causes them to work together for our good. God created the heavens and the earth with a spoken word. He said, let there be light, and there was light. When God purposes something, it cannot be stopped. When God decrees something, it cannot fail. When God declares something, it must come to pass. God is in charge of all things. He is in control of everything. He is sovereign over the heavens and the earth. And so when the Bible said God causes, those words are on purpose. When it says God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, all things, all things must work together for the good of those who love God because God causes it to. It can be no other way. Christian, there can be no doubt about this. Every trial, every tribulation, every success, every failure, every triumph, every fall, indeed everything and all things must and will work together for your good because God will cause it to. He's declared it. It must be so. It must come to pass. In Isaiah 46, 9, these are tremendous verses right here. Isaiah 46, 9, if you are someone who underlines verses or highlights verses, these are some tremendous, tremendous verses. Isaiah 46, 9, it says this, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God's purposes will be established. He will accomplish all of his good pleasure. He is the one who causes, therefore, it cannot fail. It must come to pass. He is the one who causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. And so with that, let's stop and I'll pray Father, we just thank you for this most amazing, amazing promise. Lord, a promise that only you could fulfill. Lord, we thank you that you cause all things to work together for good to those who love you. We thank you, Lord, that we can lean into that promise and know that it is true in every circumstance. And Father, we pray now for your continued blessing as we study your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.